let's just talk about your work as an investigative journalist okay. first. Um, I worked for the New York Daily News for 18 years. Most of that time I was a member of a sports investigative team. And we covered a lot of different issues over those years. We, we did a lot of stories on performance enhancing drugs and athletes. We, we covered uh, the Roger Clemens uh, situation with the Mitchell report. He was accused of using steroids in a report that baseball uh, funded. Um, uh, we covered the Balco case. We covered uh, the uh, Alex Rodriguez, the uh, biogenesis case. Um, I covered a lot of issues in terms of fraud in sports memorabilia. Um, and one of the more satisfying things, you know, personally that I covered was uh, sexual abuse in sports. And we really exposed um, some of the issues and some of the, the, the hidden dangers and some of the characters lurking in sports. Um, you know, some of that was really gratifying work. Now, were there more um, people that you covered? When I came to New York, uh, I had been working at the Rocky Mountain News in Denver, Colorado as a, as a reporter, and my friend and uh, longtime boss, Terry Thompson, encouraged me to come to New York and join this sports, investi sports investigative team that she was starting. Um, and one of the first stories we really dived into was sexual abuse in sports. We had heard rumors that there was a man named Ernie Lorch, who was the founder and the leader of the Riverside Church uh, basketball program, um, had been sexually abusing uh, children. Uh, it was a rumor that was rife in New York. People talked about it. People laughed about it. And I remember the first time I heard it being horrified. Um, you know, I was with a bunch of guys who we went to a basketball game uh, and we were uh, talking. We went to a diner afterwards. Uh, these were guys who were like coaches and runners on the local scene. Um, and they started to talk about sexual abuse and, and the Riverside Church, and I was horrified. And we started to dig into that. And that was one of the first stories our sports investigative team really did um, that, that got a big splash. Uh, Lorch was ultimately charged, um, the, the New York City Police Department uh, and the uh, uh, district attorney's office had uh, conducted an investigation into him. No criminal charges came out of that, but he was charged in Massachusetts. Um, he died before that case got resolved, but there were a number of people who came forward and said they had been abused by him. Some of them had filed lawsuits. So um, that was how we really got into this issue, uh, going back to about 2000 or 2001. Um, that was when I first started to explore this issue. Um, after Lorch and after the Riverside Church, we started to hear about other cases. Um, there was uh, Bob Oliva, who was a basketball coach at uh, Christ the King High School in Queens. Uh, Christ the King, like the Riverside Church, was a really prominent basketball program, not only here in New York, but around the country. A lot of big names um, had played at both, uh, uh, both programs. Uh, Lamar Odom, for example, went to um, Christ the King. Um, and Oliva, we heard about uh, that a family friend had accused Oliva of sexual uh, abuse many, many years ago when, when this guy who's now I think probably in his 50s or late 40s was a teenager going back to the 1970s. And, um, uh, and Oliva uh, resigned from the school. He was sort of pushed out. Uh, the school denied that there was any wrongdoing there. Um, but, uh, and this was an interesting case because the statute of limitations in New York um, barred law enforcement or the victim in this case uh, from uh, going to court or filing criminal charges or anything like that. So much time had passed. And the statute of limitations in New York is very, um, it really limits how victims can seek justice. You know, they really only have a few years after they turn uh, 18 to pursue justice. So this man's window in New York uh, had closed uh, decades earlier. Um, but what was interesting was he uh, pursued charges in Massachusetts. Oliva had taken him to Boston in uh, 1976 to see the Yankees play the Red Sox. And that year was significant because uh, the Olympics were going on. And the victim here, Jimmy, 
Um, he he remembered, you know, being. He, they went to. Uh, they they got into the locker room. Uh, they got into the dugouts. You know, uh, Oliva had connections, and those connections got him uh, into the locker room. And Jimmy could get autographs and things like that. And he remembered watching the Olympics with some of the Yankee players, some of the Red Sox players, watching like having the Olympics, 1976 Olympics, on in the background. Um, so what was interesting about Massachusetts was the statute of limitations, the clock on that stops running when you leave the state. So Jimmy was abused in Massachusetts, um, and then the clock stops running. And there were the Suffolk County uh, prosecutors uh, in Massachusetts were extremely aggressive in going after Oliva. And they wound up charging him um, with, uh, with you know, child sexual assault charges. He wound up pleading guilty. Uh, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever covered and I've ever seen. Uh, Jimmy Carlino confronting his abuser in court. Uh, I, I'm getting, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck are just going up thinking about that day. It was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. Um, what do you mean when you say the clock stops running if you leave the state? <clears throat> With the statute of limitations, in Massachusetts, the way it worked is um, uh, you only have, you know, I, and I'm not sure what the statute of limitations, what the cutoff was in, in Massachusetts. In New York, it's 23. Um, but you have a certain amount of time to file criminal charges after you are assaulted in these cases. But when you leave the state, the clock on that time stops. Um, so when you come back into the state, then it resumes again. So Jimmy had not been, not, had not spent much time, and Oliva presumably had not been spending much time in Massachusetts. And so the prosecutors there felt, you know, this is a case we can, we can go after. They did remarkable work. The, the investigators and the prosecutors in that case really need to be commended because they did remarkable work. And what was remarkable about it was that you know, Jimmy Carlino and Bob Oliva did not have any real connections um, to Boston or to Massachusetts. Uh, but the prosecutors there, remember Boston was the center of the Catholic Church scandal. That had blown up. And I think the prosecutors there were very aware and very eager to right old wrongs, you know, and bring justice to these kind of victims. And so I, you know, I just commend them and the work that they did. Um, it was really tremendous stuff. You know, it's funny you should mention the, the church situation because I always bring up Spotlight. Did you see Spotlight? Yes. Okay. And that whole, you know, those reporters um, are the ones who brought out the scandal, what was going on inside yes. of the, the... Right. So let's talk about um, how you as a journalist or how, how the media in general, how we handle... Uh, cases like this, like you have a situation, you heard rumors about that coach. Right. And so how, how, let's talk about how you handled such sensitive things where there are no charges and how you have to be sensitive with people's reputations, but then you also can't, um, you know, we have to do things that are of the public interest. Yeah. So let's talk about why you decided to pick up this story, you know, how that happened and, and, to, and that the Daily News actually published okay. it. Okay. Uh, sexual abuse cases for uh, reporters and journalists are extremely difficult, uh, particularly when there are no criminal charges filed or a lawsuit filed or some sort of official, you know, announcement or movement on it. And so uh, when we cover these cases, whether it was the, uh, you know, the Riverside Church or the Oliva case at, at Christ the King High School, um, Poly Prep High School is another case we followed in, in Brooklyn. It was a private prep school where a coach uh, allegedly abused uh, scores, if not hundreds, of kids over a couple of decades. Um, you know, each case presents its own opportunities and, and challenges. In, in the case of um, the Riverside Church and Ernie Lorch, uh, we were not really comfortable reporting on that until we learned that. Uh, the New York, the you know, Manhattan District Attorney's uh, Office had begun an investigation and they actually created a hotline and were encouraging people who had information about Lorch to call that. That gave us our hook. That was how we were able to report that case. With Oliva, um, you know, it was a very difficult case. He was a well-respected coach. I had known him a little bit, uh, you know, personally. I'd met him a few times. I found him to be a nice guy, a charming guy. and. Uh, I wanted to make sure, you know, we always want to be careful in these cases because this is one of the worst things 
you can accuse someone of. You know, short of murder, I'm not sure there's anything worse than accusing someone of being a sexual predator, uh, you know, someone who preys on children. And particularly with a guy like Bob Oliva, he worked with children. He was a, you know, he was a high school coach, a high school teacher. Um, but we felt comfortable reporting that story when uh, we heard that he was going to resign from the school. Um, well, no, let me back up on that. First, we heard that there was a, a letter that went that the school sent out to parents, or a notification that we received some allegations. Um, no. Can I stop that yeah, and yeah, break yeah. that up again? Because mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm getting can, that can, wrong. Yeah, yeah. you can I'm begin again with that yeah. point. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the case of Bob Oliva, um, we heard that there were allegations of sexual abuse and that the school had been talking to students and parents about that. Um, and so that gave us an in to report on that, that, that this had become now a public issue um, in that school's community. Uh, we covered the poly prep case very aggressively. Uh, there was a lawsuit that was filed on behalf of uh, 12 plaintiffs. They were former students who cl claimed that they had been sexually abused by a football coach. Uh, so that was, a, that was a relatively easy case to get into um, because the case was really all outlined in those court documents. Uh, that was a case where uh, the media here in New York didn't really give that case a lot of coverage. There were some, you know, 300 word stories in the, in the, pa in the papers. But um, I read the court papers in that and I was really moved by that story and I called the lawyer, Kevin Mulhern, um, who represented those plaintiffs and did really great work for them. And it took a little while for him to get on board with me doing a story. But uh, once the Penn State case broke, then I think he realized this was an issue that needed public um, scrutiny, public attention, and he agreed to work with me and allow me to interview his, uh, his clients. Okay, and so how did you get with all of that, uh, and there were no lawsuits or charges in this case, in the Bambada situation, so how did you, um, you know, pick that story up or decide to, to go with that? The Bambada case was interesting. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on how we got involved in that. Um, the Daily News, the editor at the time uh, was a guy named Jim Rich, and uh, there was a case on Long Island, there was a foster father uh, who was accused of sexually abusing kids that had been placed in his care uh, over a course of you know decades. It was a horrifying case, horrifying. Um, it was literally like, it wasn't like putting the fox in front of, you know, in charge of the hen house, it was like bringing the hens to the fox's den. It was a really awful, disturbing case. And so Jim decided that he learned, and our reporters had learned, something that I already, as a sports guy, had already known, that the statute of limitations in New York was uh, very prohibitive and it really barred uh, victims from seeking uh, justice in, in these sort of cases. And he decided he was gonna focus on, on this um, and we were gonna address this as a newspaper. Um, and I remember uh, one of the city editors came to me and said, we're going to take this on and Jim wants to know if you will give us some of your names of your sources and things like that. And I said, no, absolutely not. I'm going to do this. Um, so they brought me on. They took me off the sports beat for a while and they brought me on to that. Um, and we had st we'd established a hotline. Um, we asked people who had been uh, affected by New York statute limitations to call us and tell us their stories. One of the first calls, maybe the first call we got, was from a gentleman named Ronald Savage, a uh, bee stinger. He was part of Zulu Nation, close to Bambata back, uh, back in the day, back in the uh, late 70s or early 80s. Um, it was a very difficult case for us to uh, report on, but there were a couple of things that were really helpful. You know, there were no criminal charges and there was no lawsuit, and most likely there would not be because the statute of limitations, either you know, for criminal charges or civil lawsuit, just was prohibitive. Ronald was never going to, uh, it was going to be very difficult for him to get over that hurdle. Um, but Ronald had a couple of things going for him. He, he had done an interview uh, with uh, Star, uh, with the old New York uh, City uh, morning disc jockey, um, big player in the hip hop community. He'd, he had just done that. He had just written a book. Uh, so that gave us something to report on. In, in addition, you know, we, we just hustled. You know, I worked on this with a couple of other reporters, uh, Ben Kochman and uh, Shana Jacobs. And, uh, you know, those guys and, and myself, we just hustled to find people to try to verify to see if this was, if there was any truth to this. 
one of the things that made us really comfortable with moving forward was that after uh, Ronald, after Bee Stinger had made his allegations, he was approached by a couple of guys that were close to Bambata uh, who kind of ordered him slash requested that he stop talking about these allegations publicly. They offered him money. Um, we had a tape of that. Uh, we got tapes of those conversations. And so we felt like there's smoke here. We could move forward on that. Did you speak to any of the other victims? Uh, let's talk about, I wanted you to say what <laughs> kind of pictures started to, to be painted as you were working on this story. It, you know, it started in dribs and drabs. We did a really big story on on uh, this whole issue, and we focused on Ron, Ron Savage. Um, and I found him to be uh, a believable guy. I found him to be a, um, you know, he was a sweet, uh, gentle man. Um, he, he, he got very emotional when he talked about this. We had talked to a lot of people that knew him, both you know, back in the early 80s when this abuse allegedly happened, and now, and people told us he's, he's a straight shooter. He's not a dishonest guy. One of the guys we talked to said, you know, Ronald's the kind of guy you could leave money on the table and walk out the room and you come back and the money hasn't been touched. Um, you know, and so he had a lot of people uh, uh, saying that he was a credible person, that he was an honest person. Um, you know, we also, uh, we wound up talking to people who knew, uh, you know, a lot of people off the record, people were not eager to come forward at first, but we talked to some people off the record, said, yeah, we heard about this, this is true. Um, there's another thing with Ronald uh, that I forgot to mention before, but w one thing that also gave him a lot of credibility for us was that, um, you know, over the years he had not shared these allegations with many people, but he had told some girlfriends, um, his ex-wife, and his ex-wife wound up sharing this with a uh, with her like new beau, and the new beau and Ronald got into it in a, on a subway car one one day, uh, and this guy started saying, um, "I know about Bambata, I know about Bambata," and he wound up assaulting Ronald, and and Ronald filed a police report, and this was all in that police report. So he had made these allegations a few years ago. So you know, again, that was something we felt. We, we're comfortable, like there, there's a history here. All those things, all those factors of the book, the interview with, with Starr, um, all those things sort of gave us a comfort level to move forward. When we started hearing then from um, other victims and people started calling, like within a day after our story appeared, we started to get calls from people. I was also abused by Bambata. Um, same thing happened to me. And what was interesting was there was a pattern of behavior or alleged behavior on his part that all, it was all consistent. You know, it was the, the, the sexual acts, the way he approached it, um, very casual. Um, you know, he would assure people, you're not gay just because you like me to touch you there. Um, all very consistent with the guys, you know, all the guys. We wound up talking to a couple of different men who told us that, several different men who told us that they've been abused by Bambata, and their stories were all pretty consistent. Did you uh, get any uh, feedback from, like, him or his attorney at all? Any backlash? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. We spoke to, before we published our first story, we spoke to uh, uh, an attorney for Bambata. We tried to reach him. And we wound up talking to um, this attorney. Uh, she seemed uh, a little bit belligerent with us. So, you know, you're not going to report this. Uh, she was an entertainment report, uh, attorney, and I think that she was maybe not the best person. She seemed like this was not um, her specialty. Uh, and I don't think they really took all of this as serious as maybe they should have. Uh, he got another attorney after that, and that attorney seemed to have more focus on this issue, but I, I kind of got the sense in the beginning that they just didn't take this as seriously as they should have. You know, his attorney is the same attorney for Malachi York. Which one's that, uh, Miller or? Uh, Tucker. Uh, Tucker, I'm sorry, yeah, yep. Tucker, yeah, mm -hmm. David Tucker, is that his name? Charles Tucker Charles Jr. Charles Tucker, yeah, yeah. yeah. He had another attorney, Vivian. I, I saw her name, yeah. Lamaki something, I don't know. Tazaki, Tazaki T or Okay, something. right, something with a yeah. Z-I. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. She, she was. She seemed like she was a little out of her element with this kind of thing. Um, how how was you? How would you sum up your uh, interaction with Poppy 
how, what kind of guy do you think Pop was? Was he a very straightforward, believable? I saw that story that you did yeah. with him. Yeah, go ahead. Poppy was an interesting guy because uh, I heard about him first, I think, through Star. And, and Star told me, you know, this guy is, uh, he's a serious guy. Um, he's, a, he's a guy, he's, he's had criminal charges filed against him. He's not, he's not a pushover. He's not a tough guy. He's not the kind of guy, in, with sexual uh, abuse cases, so often um, men have this veneer of machismo and it's sort of hiding that you know, the, the wounds, the injuries that they suffered. And I think one of the things that struck me about Poppy first was that um, he had that, he had, you know, a certain amount of machismo, of toughness to him, but he was also quite open about talking about the wounds that he had, uh, you know, experienced and the abuse that he had suffered for, through. Um, you know, there was no, once he decided that he was going to address this, there was no fudging it, there was no hiding it. He was very straightforward with us. He was very, you know, I, I, I felt like he was working to make sure that this wasn't going to happen to anybody else. You know, that he had wrestled with this and he said enough is enough. Um, so um, let's talk about the statute of limitations because I was talking to Star and um, did, do you go to Albany with Ronald Savage? I drove. Do him you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that a little yeah. bit because I'm I really going to go there. talk about the just statute of limitations. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Ronald got invited to uh, speak at an event that was sponsored by uh, Assemblyman Margaret Markey, who was the original sponsor of the um, Child Victims Act, the bill that would eliminate the statute of limitations on child sexual abuse cases in, in New York State. And um, I remember talking to him and he was telling me he was going to take a bus up there or something like that and I was going to rent a car and I said, why don't you hop in with us? I drove uh, to Albany with a photographer, and uh, we drove up. It was a spring morning. It was a rainy morning. Um, you know, Ronald was very shy. Uh, he's a very gentle man and uh, very sweet. Um, you could see, you know, he was really nervous. He was nervous in the car driving up to Albany. You know, you got a two and a half or a three hour drive, and I don't think he said more than a few words. Um, you know, uh, he he just seemed to be preparing himself for what he had to do. Um, uh, that was a pretty powerful day. Uh, you know, it was a very powerful day because you heard from a lot of victims. Uh, Ronald was very articulate that day. He's not a great public speaker. He's not a guy who I think is com comfortable in the spotlight. Um, but he just spoke from the heart, and uh, he was really powerful that day. I think the thing that really stood out for me that day was there was a mother, or, or that week, there was a mother in Queens named Anna Wagner who had seen uh, our coverage of this on the front page of the Daily News that morning. She was like walk, walk, walking in her gym. She was going to go have a workout. She just dropped the kids off at school uh, or dealt with the kids, and uh, she was going to go have a workout, and she saw the Daily News, and she got in her car, went home, uh, changed her clothes and drove up to Albany that day and she wanted to be part of this. So uh, it was all, it was a very moving uh, experience. That whole, there was a couple of days that I spent in Albany and uh, it was incredible. It was one of those things I'll never forget. And, you know, and Ronald's part in this was really remarkable because you could see he's not a guy who's comfortable with a lot of people looking at him. But he, he showed a lot of guts that day. Okay, this is really my uh, last question. Do, would you mind repeating or telling, as a, as a journalist from New York, I'm from Chicago, and like I said, the Zulu Nation didn't mean anything to me at all, period. But you kind of have a, a, you have a reference, frame of reference when it comes to Zulu Nation, but when this came about, you were saying that you didn't even, oh, like, wow, those guys are still around? Yeah. You know, so if we could just talk about your early days with, um, you know, being a, a fan of hip hop, but not like a hip hop head, and yeah. you know, your kind of background when it comes to the music and the Zulu Nation. Yeah, and you know, maybe we want to talk also about the way Zulu Nation reacted to yeah, these yeah, allegations, yeah. so Definitely. we can get into that too. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I grew up on Long Island. Um, you know, I was a kid of the '70s and, and early '80s, and uh, you know, that was when hip hop was just starting, and. Um, uh, you know, I was more of a rock and roll guy in, in those days, but, uh, you know, these worlds were sort of, there was a lot of crossover. Uh, I remember being in a punk bar 
somewhere and hearing, you know, Grandmaster Flash and, you know, the message for the first time and, you know, just blown away. Um, I love that song and I love what they were trying to do with that. Um, you know, music was getting a little more real, you know, between punk and, uh, and hip hop, you know, even disco. People were letting their hair down and, you know, it was, it was a more fun time and there was a lot of crossover and so, you know, I was a rock and roll guy, but I like some hip hop. I like Public Enemy, and I like Run DMC. Um, but you couldn't really, you couldn't really help but, uh, you know, you, you, there was so much crossover. You go into a club, and they might be playing, um, you know, something from the Clash. You know, give them enough rope from that album or something like that. But then the next moment, they would be playing Planet Rock, or they'd be playing. Uh, the message or run DMC or something like that so it wasn't you know you, there was a lot of exposure to a lot of a um, lot of different genres it was lot, much less segregated than it is now um, and it was just fun I mean it was it was a fun time and I remember Bambata he was a huge presence you know even to some kid out on Long Island um, who was more interested in uh, you know Led Zeppelin than than hip-hop um, but he, you know you could tell there was a the, Things were changing, you know, things were, the culture was changing and the culture was turning. Um, and it was kind of a fun time, you know, to be a music fan and to be alive. Uh, so, you know, I was aware of Zulu Nation. I knew what they were. Um, I had read a lot. I was a very political guy in my uh, college days. And so, you know, Zulu Nation and other hip hop groups that were questioning the police presence in African American communities and, um, you know, all those issues that people were still dealing with now, I read a lot about those guys and I admired them. But, you know, as time went on, um, you move on, you know, and, and issues. And so when we started to cover this story and we started to hear that Zulu Nation was still around, I was like, wow, that's interesting. Like, these guys are still around. I haven't heard anything from them in, you know, at least since the early 90s. It's just, you know, I don't know if that's my fault or their fault, but they just didn't seem like they were as relevant as they were in 1982, 1983. So let's talk about their reaction to this coverage that they've been getting. Star, Star calls them a glorified gang. I, I personally call them a personality cult. Like they have two different cultures going on. Like the, they profess uh, peace, love, unity, and having fun. But on the inside, they're, especially with this situation, they're threatening their own members. Yeah. They didn't protect any of the children and things like that. So I don't know if you wanted to comment on, on what picture this has painted of this group and Africa Bambata. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, what was interesting was, so when we started we did our first story and we reached out to Zulu Nation and, and um, I don't think we heard from them immediately. The funny thing about it was then they issued some kind of a press release that called Ronald Savage uh, mentally challenged and he was just trying to generate sales from his book. Well, I mean, Ronald's not mentally challenged, he's a very bright guy. Um, that's number one. And number two, it was like a self-published book, so it's not like Oprah was going to talk about it or anything like that. Um, they also issued a statement uh, that said the Daily News was part of a government, uh, you know, New York City police, federal government conspiracy to bring down Zulu Nation. And I mean, that was the most laughable thing. That was so ridiculous and it was so stupid. And I remember laughing about this, like, wow, you know, uh, I'm working with the FBI and the NYPD now, you know, maybe uh, they can take care of my parking tickets or something like that. I didn't know. Um, I don't know. It, 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 it was it was laughable. Their, their response. They they look like fools. Um, and it, and I think there was an acknowledgement pretty quickly that their response to this was so off the rails and was so weird conspiracy theory. Some of the younger members took control of it. And a week or so after their initial stupid, you know, this is all part of a big conspiracy. The younger members took control of the situation and said. We sympathize with Ronald and with Poppy and with the other victims. Um, we condemn what Bambata said and or what Bambata did. Um, I think they got this sense of you know like reality. And what and what I heard you know later on was that the original response was crafted by uh, old school guys, guys who have been with Bambata for a long time, um, and I, I, for some reason they thought that response would fly. I don't know what. 
the hell they were thinking, because it was such a stupid response, it really was. Um, but they were much more sympathetic uh, as, a, as an organization after that. And what, what, one thing that was pretty remarkable to me was, in June of 2016, uh, in support of the Child Victims Act and the effort to reform the statute of limitations here in New York, there was a march across the Brooklyn Bridge. It was led by Marge Markey, and um, there were a lot of people that have been working on this issue were involved in that march. Um, and uh, members of Zulu Nation came uh, and participated that, you know, in support of Ronald and some of these other people. So, you know, I, I, you have to give the good with the bad on this. You know, you have to give those guys credit for showing up and, you know, letting the world know that they care. Yeah, this is this is just my commentary. So it's always funny to me because I look at a lot of these groups and have done stories on a, on quite a few of them that you'll have a group, the leader, the inner circle or the high ranking officials, whatever you want to call it. And then the peripheral people, the, they're the ones pushing the ideology <coughs> of the group, not knowing that that's not even what the group is doing yeah. at all. So those people who did march, and I saw that statement and all of that, those are the ones who really believed in what they were doing. Yeah. They just didn't know what was really going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think they got blindsided by yeah. the leadership. You know, yeah. And they have no idea guy. what was, because they're all young. They're yeah. not, like you said, the, the older ones have been around since it be began. They, they're not old people joining the Zoo Nation. Yeah. So the younger ones were the hip hop heads and people like that so I don't know if you want to comment on this either but a major problem that I have like we have the allegations against Bambada himself I I really have a problem with the Zulu Nation because of the ad other adults and I talked to um, Marcy Hamilton yesterday and th there were other adults like in the next room. Now, if you live in the projects, the projects, if you have a pro an apartment in the projects, you don't have like this whole floor is not my mm -hmm. party. You know what I'm saying? It's close quarters. It's yeah. usually more than enough people in there and there would be people in the next room. Yeah. Well, I can ask you a question on that is, um, did you try to, did you, did you try to reach any of the other um, people who were named on Star Show, like the victims would name other people who were there. And Ron, even Ronald Savage, even said that, that there was another man who brought Bambada to my house. There was another man in the room who came in in a room with, with his, yeah. you know. And I think Bambada ordered him at one point to give this guy yes, like oral the sex. the sister's or, boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think we did try to contact everybody. I'm not sure if we had everybody's name, but like the sister's boyfriend, I think we knew who that was. Um, we called a ton of people, you know, I just don't remember everybody we, 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 we try, you know, it was a year ago, so I don't remember everyone we, we try. I remember most of the people we talked to, um, but I'm sure we would have said, who was that? Who was that? And tried to call those, tried to call those folks. Yeah. Okay. I know we, we knocked on a lot of doors. Uh, Shana Jacobs knocked on a ton of doors in chasing this thing down. And they clammed up pretty much, I'm sure. Yeah, or people had moved or, yeah. you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it was just, um, I know I made a lot of phone calls. We, you know, we had a, a, a library at the Daily News that uh, we had a staff there that could find uh, phone numbers and addresses and things like that. And it really did tremendous work. Um, I, you know, I think at some point people just wouldn't talk to us. There was a lot of fear around this case. You know, the one thing you have to remember was that even though Bambada wasn't like the star that he was in the 1980s, he's still a pretty influential guy in, in you know, in, in hip hop circles. Um, and, you know, I think with sexual abuse, it's a really difficult thing for people to talk about. Um, and so, People, it was difficult. That's why, you know, Bee Stinger and Poppy and the other men that we talked to need to get commended, you know, because they had the guts to come forward and, you know, and in a case of uh, Poppy and Ronald, you know, they put their names to it and they said, this is who I am. And you really got to give those guys, you know, all the credit in the world for having the guts to do that. 
and they, it's funny because you, you, they're not strangers from nowhere. You know, like somebody that's popped up from Des Moines, Iowa. Like, it, I was abused by Bam Bob. It's like, who the hell are you? They from that area. One, yeah, one of the things that made us feel comfortable about reporting this was we had pictures of Ronald Savage as a small kid. You know, he was like a, what they called a crate kid. And he would carry the records that DJs like Bambato or other guys would use at these, you know, huge parties in the Bronx and these, uh, you know, outdoor spaces in parks or in the uh, rec centers or things like that. So you go back and you look at pictures from those days, and there's little Ronald Savage, you know, sitting on the end, uh, big old smile on his face, and uh, you know, he's he's right in the middle of that action. So, you know, he was not a stranger to Bambata, that's for sure.